Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Hello. On today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm talking to Ted Ling, who is a former employee of the National Archives of Australia and the National Library of Australia, long-term resident of Canberra, and visitor today to the Robert Menzies Institute on his way to the Celtic Festival in Port Arlington. And it's wonderful to have you here, Ted. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, it's a delight. And Ted, today we're going to talk about Canberra, particularly the development of Canberra and particularly the National Capital Development Commission. But I recorded a podcast a few weeks ago with Gary Humphreys, who's writing his PhD on the ACT Assembly. And we talked quite a lot about Canberra. and The former politician. The former politician, the former senator, and of course, chief minister as well. So it's actually a fascinating story, the story of Canberra, one that we should all be more familiar with, given it's our nation's capital. But I wondered if you could just paint a picture for our listeners about how Canberra came to be. And you're talking way back in 1913. Yes, because it was farmland, really, wasn't it? It was, it was. I mean, there were... (laughs) At the time of Federation. The actual selection of the site took years because, and there were disputes between New South Wales and Victoria as to which state would have the capital. Yeah. And both were adamant they would not support the other, having the capital anywhere close by, say, for example, to Sydney or Melbourne. So... In the end, a compromise had to be reached. Capital would be in New South Wales, but would be well away from Sydney, not close by. And so then they had to go searching for a site. And before they finally found, well, what became Canberra was where they were going to put the capital because it was good quality land, well watered, and the climate was quite, well, I hate to say mild because Canberra can be freezing in the winter and hot in the summer, but it met most of the essential criteria. Yes. So, in the end, they chose Canberra, and the site for Canberra, in March 1913. And then they started moving, setting up some institutions, building a few houses, and relocating public servants from Melbourne. That's all good. In the 1920s, there was more work being done. But then they hit the Great Depression in 1929, followed by World War II, and almost everything grinds to a halt. I love the discussion around the naming of Canberra. And I have a list here of the names that were suggested for Canberra before they chose Canberra. Kookaburra, Wheat Wool Gold, Kangaremu, Sydney Mel Per Ad Brisho, and Mel Adney Per Bain. <laughs> Good, aren't they? Oh, they're fantastic. But, of course, Canberra was chosen because it was the name that the local Aboriginal people were using for the area and also has a wonderful meaning of meeting place, meeting which place, is yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah, But there's also in that development in the very early days of Canberra, once it was founded in 1913, the minister in charge of this was King O'Malley, wasn't it? Yes. And I love that he establishes Canberra as a dry city, but now there is, of course, a pub named after him. Yes. I guess... In the city centre. no sense of irony? No, in the city centre. <laughs> in the city centre that stands there to this day. <laughs> I walked past it the other day, but yes. <laughs> and I hope people raise a, what do you say in Canberra, not a pot that's here in Victoria. Well, pints. A usually. pint, you raise a pint to, to King O'Malley, the steadfast teetotaler. <laughs> I mean, the Great Depression did a lot to, I guess, dampen the development of Australia more broadly, but obviously had that impact on Canberra. I mean, when you're prioritising people being able to put food on the table, developing a capital way down the list of priorities, doesn't it? It does, but there still were things that went ahead. For example, a public swimming pool in the suburb of Manica actually went ahead. It was opened in 1930. It's a beautiful pool too. But if you've seen it, you'll know it's it's short. It's not the full 50-yard length because when the proposal went to the Public Works Committee, the committee decided they'd give the approval, but they'd have to make it shorter, reduce it from 50 yards down to 30 yards, and also scrap the heating system. It was to be heated. Is that right? So So it's an austerity pool. 
it did go ahead, but yeah. in a reduced fashion. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, I mean, and, and, you know, really indicative of the constraints of the times, yeah. But one thing that also went ahead, having talked about the doom and gloom of Canberra, was one other thing I wanted to mention, and that was the War Memorial, because it was being planned and thought about during, after World War One, obviously, but then, as the plan started to take shape, the War Memorial was actually built and officially opened in November 1941. So actually, it's right in the middle of World War II, and they built this monument to basically the First World War. But it was one exception to the rule. When you say Canberra was dere- almost derelict or everything stagnated, there were a few exceptions. And it's interesting, in that period between the Great Depression and World War II, you still have a lot of government departments in Melbourne, don't you? And in fact... I think during World War Two, a lot of the key meetings were actually held at the Victoria Barracks on St Kilda Road. They were, yes. Yeah, so this sort of idea that all the important decisions of the nation were happening in Canberra doesn't happen no. until quite some time later. Even some of the public servants who were based in Canberra were gradually moving to back to Melbourne. And so the great bulk of public servants were in Melbourne when the war was over. So when the war ends in 1945. The Prime Minister of Australia, of course, is Ben Chifley, having taken over after the sudden death of John Curtin Mm -hmm. earlier in 1945. What was Canberra looking like as a nation's capital? Not very impressive. (laughs) And basically, you have one scholar referred to it as Canberra as suburbs in search of a city. Yeah. Because you had two groups of small houses either side of the Malolo River. So there was no lake, of course, that no. didn't come for years. Yeah. And so, Which is so hard to imagine now. You think, like, 70 years ago there was no lake, but the lake looks like it's been there forever. It does. Yeah. It really does. I think the lake makes Canberra, but yes. that's, it would save that for later. But, you know, you've got these two lots of suburbs, houses, buildings on either side of the river, almost at Lake River, and then you've got a couple of low bridges, which, of course, flooded from time to time, and so the two halves would continue to be separated. And in terms of population, it was pretty tiny, wasn't it? It was about 15,000 people. It was. It wasn't growing rapidly at all. That would come later again. So what's then the impetus behind getting Canberra up and going and developing into a really proud capital? What goes on? It starts basically in 1947-48 with the Chifley government wanting to start relocating public servants from Melbourne to Canberra and basically they've got the plans, they've got the proposals. And these were the plans that Walter Burley Griffin and his wife Marion had developed Yes, and they were the winners of a competition, weren't they? An international competition to design Australia's capital. But that was long long ago, so now they're coming out with that. But what they're looking at is not so much Canberra's expansion as a national capital, but bringing the public service from Melbourne to Canberra because it's very difficult to administer the public service when it's hundreds of miles away. And so they've got plans, they've got a seven to ten year plan, they're going to transfer over 7,000 public servants. Mm. When Chifley's government loses office in 49, they've moved basically no one. It really wasn't the political will to make it happen or to finance it. And then Robert Menzies is elected in 1949 and then in 1952... He's talking with Bill Dunk, who is chairman of the Public Service Board, and Bill Dunk was the man who had come up with the plans for the Shipley government a few years earlier. He tells the Prime Minister what he's done then and what he could do now, and then they start planning, we're going to relocate public servants. But the same almost malaise comes in again, because you've got not the will to make it happen, the finances to make it happen, but also to deal with public servants' objection to making it happen, because... You've got public servants, most of them, here in Melbourne and a you know, well-developed city, and you've got this little almost village-like. In Canberra, most public servants don't want to go there. So there's a bit Which, of... you know, is understandable. <laughs> so there's a lot of resistance, a yeah. very passive resistance to not going ahead, and it starts, and it happens a couple of times, that the, you know, the government, means his government, the cabinet, comes up with ideas of, we're going to start relocating public servants. And a couple of years go by, nothing happened. 
this is from the top of the public service down that there's resistance because, you know, if a minister says, well, your government department needs to move from St Kilda Road, Melbourne to you know, <laughs> Commonwealth Avenue in Canberra or something, then it, surely it just happens. No, you've got to, you've got to make it happen because biggest department of course, was Defence and that was the yeah. one the government really wanted to move. Yes. They didn't want to be moved. And so basically, but they're not in charge. The no, government. No, but how do you get around it? Yes, is you start delaying proposals. You make the proposals more grand than they needed to be. Uh, uh, you come up with numbers of the thousands of public servants that will have to be relocated. It will cost tens of you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. I almost said dollars, but pounds. So there's a, just a gradual resistance. And what I find interesting too, Ted, is the Minister for the Territories, Paul Haslark, he certainly was no fan of investing political capital or, I guess, financial capital in this project either. Didn't he say there was many more important jobs for the government than aggrandising Canberra? Yes, he did. In fact, several times when he was a member of Cabinet, Cabinet was discussing proposals for Canberra, he wouldn't have a bar of it. And, of course, he comes from Western Australia, so maybe he was looking to have resources sent across there rather than have them come to Canberra. So what made Robert Menzies think, OK, we've had enough proposals that are ridiculous, reports that are drawn out, public service delaying, prevaricating? What changes his attitude? I think there are two things. One, there were senior public servants, Ron Mendelson and Ken... Clint Hurd. Ken Hurd. Thank you. And they've done a a number of proposals to the government presentation. They're public servants, but they're saying that this has got to come to an end. But the thing that really makes it happen is that Robert Menzies becomes a grandfather in March 1956. And you might wonder, what's that got to do with anything? Yeah. But Robert and his wife, Patty, they don't on this granddaughter, Edwina, mm. born in March 56. We were just admiring the photograph of yes. Robert Menzies cradling baby Edwina in his arms, I would say maybe when she was about one year old or so. So, uh, yes, a much-cherished grandchild, but with yeah. grandchildren come some well, he, obstacles. So what happens is now the Prime Minister has been basically harassed at home by his wife and his daughter. Basically, Paddy Menzies says to him, Bob, you try pushing your stram around these awful streets and footpaths. And Heather, his daughter, says, Dad, it's impossible to get a house here. Sounds just like today, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But he realises that something's got to be done. And he says that, well, he realises that Canberra has been made the capital. There's no way of getting around that. So you've got to actually start making it the capital. And he says in later memoirs, once I converted myself to this faith, I became an apostle. And he did. And he really does appreciate what needs to be done. Ted, would you say that the personal experience of Canberra's lack of development that he experienced was critical to his changing attitude? I mean, would he have changed his attitude anyway? I'm not certain. I mean, he's been dazed and harassed at home. Mm-hmm. And then... Basically, he decides to go for a drive around Canberra. He does this in April 1956, and he's not happy with what he's seen. He comes back very unhappy about the lack of development, the poor quality design, basically the all-round just ugliness of the place. And he writes a letter to Alan Fairhall, Minister for the Interior, and saying, who's responsible for this? What's going on? And I'm not going to approve any more substantial funding unless we get serious about this. And it starts to go from there. And then he, in July that year, he leaves for London to attend a Prime Minister's conference and he asks Ken Hurd, we spoke about before, to prepare a paper for him on what are the needs of Canberra. And Hurd does that and the paper is ready for the Prime Minister when he returns. And so we're now into 1957. This is when they start looking now seriously at developing Canberra and who's going to do it. They've decided it's going to be a single agency that will have, hesitate to say, supreme power, but considerable power. And we're almost there now, except there's one more hiccup, because Alan Fairhall, who's Minister for Works and Interior, is being nobbled by his department. They don't want this new this new body undermining their authority, so they're trying to scuttle him or white-hand him to stop this happening, or 
to agree that the agency will be created, but it will have limited powers. It will be responsible to the ministers, which is them, the departments. And that again, Ken Hurd comes out and he basically talks to the Prime Minister and says, no, it's got to be an agency with absolute power to get these things done. And that leads to the legislation which goes into Parliament in 1957 to create the Commission. So it's sort of the National Capital Development Commission is created as a statutory authority. So it is answerable to the Minister uh, ultimately. But in terms of decisions day to day, it's delegated to make a very significant range of decisions around building in Canberra, planning, investment of funds and the like. Yes, it was. And of course, we need to remember these were days when there was no ACT assembly, which didn't happen till the late 1980s. So things that happened in Canberra were the federal government's domain and its domain only. There was a National Planning Advisory Committee that had been established in 1930, but the minister could ignore its advice and usually did. Mm. And it was abolished when the National Capital Development Commission came in. Mm. Before we move on, Ted, when you talked about the 1956 drive that Menzies took around Canberra where he was realising how grim things looked, there's a quote, I think from his memoirs, where he notes the prevalence of squat flat top buildings which needed only a few bales of hay and a goat on the roof to be painfully reminiscent of Suez or Port Said. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was the letter he sent to Alan Fairhall. yes. So you get a sense that things were pretty limited in dear old Canberra in the 1950s. So this National Capital Development Commission was established under legislation, much to the disappointment of the Department of the Interior. What does it achieve? What does it set out to do? Is it implementing the plans that Walter Burley Griffin had written all those years ago? Well, it's called Implementing the Canberra Plan. Yeah. The one of which the key issue is, of course, is the lake. Yes. So you've got, well, there are multiple aims and tasks it's given. Of course, it's going to have to coordinate the relocation of public servants from Melbourne. They're now determined it's going to happen. But also then there's the development. Because if you bring in thousands of public servants to Canberra, you've got to have accommodation to put them in. You've got to have houses. You've got to have shopping centres. You've got to have schools for all their families. So all of that's now starting to take off. I mean, how is this actually achieved? Just talk me through the process around the lake. I mean, had they kept all that land clear with the view that one day the lake would be built? Not maybe. I suppose you could say yes, but I suspect also because you needed the dam to create the lake. Yes. And if you didn't, if you just built it without the dam, you'd have this little river running through the middle, which often flooded. So you couldn't use the land anyway. There were so frequent instances of flooding so they had to build the lake, but they had to build a dam to help create the lake. And then you've got this marvellous item in the middle of the city. And tell me why was the lake so important to the development of Canberra? Because, I mean, it seems so iconic now. You can't imagine Canberra without the lake and you know, all those sort of beautiful bridges that cross it and the fountain in the middle. And there's, I think, Queen. they've renamed it Queen Elizabeth Island and the like. They have the Carillion. But I mean, why? That's quite a big investment in something that functionally doesn't have a huge amount of use. The lake goes back to Billy Griffin's drawings because he included a lake. Yes. That, and there were several t- you know, investigations by the Public Works Committee, but it never quite, like everything else, never took off until there was the political will. And there's also the money. And there's a delightful story, again, that Menzies tells in his memoirs, where he Cabinet has met and agreed to allocate a million pounds for the construction of the lake. This is the late 50s. Menzies goes off to London for a Prime Minister's conference, all happy that he's got the funding. What he doesn't know is that Treasury is vehemently opposed to spending a million pounds on a lake for Canberra. There are other priorities. And so Treasury gets to work on some of the ministers to get them to agree the funding would be struck out. So it means he comes back home, finds out that, of course, what he thought had been approved actually hadn't. And so the next media of cabinet, he tells his colleagues that he's heard that the funds for the lake have been struck out. And he asks, have I been reliably informed? Knowing perfectly well he had been. And then he says, well, can we now assume that the funds are struck back in? Mm-hmm. And they were. It's interesting thinking about other capital cities, how they 
tend to be along like either beside a body of water or having a major body of water through them. You have the Thames in London. You have the river through Paris, and, um, Seine, yeah. the Seine River, the river through Washington, D.C. I mean, that seems, well, it's a feature. Is it essential? I'm not sure. But Menzies thought it was pretty essential, didn't oh, he? Did. He, he yeah. did. And he got to open the first of the two bridges, Kings Avenue. But why is a body of water important for a capital city? I think it's partly aesthetics and partly just relaxation. You're right in that it served no substantial purpose other than just being mainly decorative. And then you you mentioned earlier the two bridges that go over it leading up to Parliament House. But when the bridges were built, Parliament House wasn't on top of the Capitol Hill and it wasn't going to be. It was going to be now down on the shores of the lake. But that changed later. So again, I think Menzies would have been pleased that the new Parliament House, if it had been built in his time, would have been built on the lake. How early on did... So the old Parliament House, what we know now as old Parliament House, which of course was Parliament House in Menzies' day, was built in the... You're testing me now in the 1930s? 27. 27. It opened in 27. In 27. So it was built in the 1920s. Was there always a view that there would be a new Parliament House or was the view at the time this was it and this was all we needed? It was, well, because it was called the Provisional Parliament House when it was built. And again, in the 1920s, I think there was always an idea that it was a temporary building. Somewhere along the way, it would be replaced by a new one, a permanent one. But that didn't really happen. But as Parliament began to expand, a number of politicians and their staff, the old Provisional Parliament House became a real squeeze. But the new building wasn't built until the 80s. And why was that? Because it wasn't necessary until the 80s or because oh, Parliament House was adequate? I mean, by the end, they were just falling out of it, weren't they? I don't think old Parliament House was adequate, but also, again, to go and build a whole new Parliament House, say, in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, there might have been opposition just generally about the cost. And so to actually decide we're going to do it, to actually make it happen, again, takes a lot of will and a lot of nerve to hold your nerve, as it were, to deal with the opposition. Walsh and Burley Griffin's plans were quite specific about the placement of the Parliament, weren't they, in the, the War Memorial with the lake, and that from the Parliament you could see the War Memorial, which meant that, I mean, I'm remembering tours I've done of the War Memorial, where they said that the decision makers, those who decide to send Australian men and women to war, need to look at the War Memorial while they're making that decision and know the gravity of their decision. Yes, is, yes. is that true? It is, although I'm trying to think too, just you know, running back in my memory, I have a vague notion that you had the Parliament House at one side of the river there, but where the War Memorial is now, there was actually going to be a casino. Oh, But I need to just check on that to confirm, but <laughs> there was going to be a casino and my memory, which is vague, is telling me that it was ultimately where the War Memorial was located. Well, I think, uh, yeah, perhaps doesn't have the quite the same gravity looking at a casino than the War Memorial. That's no, no, sure. no. Then you've got so you've got the War Memorial, old Parliament House, or provisional, and then the new one behind it. They're all lined up. So, after the lake is built in Canberra, how quickly does Canberra develop after that? Well, actually, quite quickly because the lake is finished in I think 1964. By then, you've already had several thousand public servants relocated. They started moving in 1959 from Melbourne to Canberra. Then you've got also the first new suburbs are being built. Basically, that's Woden and Western Creek in South Canberra. They're the first, with the first suburb being Hughes, and a number of ministers, including Doug Anthony, actually bought a house in Hughes. So by that's 64, and then a few years later, about 68, you have Bill Cotton, which was the second of the satellite cities, and then Tugrenol in 1973 was the third. But throughout the late 50s, 59 is when the relocation of public servants really gets underway, and then it goes right through the 60s. And tell me, so by 59, what's the attitude of the public service? Is it just fatalistic, this is happening, we, there's not much more we can do? They're resigned that it's happening. Yeah. They can't yeah. really stop it now. Do you have a sense of whether many people left the public service at that time, not wanting to move to Canberra? Or I don't, but I imagine there would have been some you know, who had families and strong ties in Melbourne would have preferred to stay and maybe left the public service. I mean, I don't have numbers, but I'm sure there would have been some. 
And what were the debates around the movement of the public service out of centres of population where so-called real people to live in this little Canberra bubble, basically? Yeah. You've got public service are moving, but you've also got to have accommodation for them, work accommodation. So particularly with defence, that's when they started building offices at Russell, Canberra suburb of Russell, which is near the Australian-American War Memorial. Mm. And the number of buildings have been built there. So the public servants from Defence are going there. And then there's other buildings being built as well. Very quickly, this is really the heyday for the National Capital Development Commission because their buildings are going up everywhere. And who's building them and what's the design? Because Menzies is obviously very concerned about the design in the 50s. He's saying they show a lack of imagination, dozens of identical cottage, each the same distance from the footpath. He'd separated from the next by very small gaps. I mean, he's not impressed. No, he wasn't. And it still continues like that for a while. But the, so was, did the commission have a design that they were just requiring, you know, putting out to tender and getting builders to produce? They did. They did and they actually basically working out where all these departments are going to be located. Defence is a, a given. It's going to be at Russell, but others will be in the centre of the city. And then as the camera starts to develop, with, I mentioned Wote and Western Creek and Milconnen, more buildings are being built there for public service as well. So they're going in all around Canberra. But also houses are being built as well. Now they're starting to shift, if you like. There's still not a lot of design that's going into them, but they're all solid houses and they were known for a long time as Gubbies or ex-Gubbies. That was their nickname. I owned one myself for a number of years, but eventually they were all being sold off. It was when the department stopped building houses and they contracted out to the private industry sphere. And were these houses owned by the residents or were they owned by the commission? Who They were owned by the commission, but yes. eventually as they start to stop building ex gubbies the plan is then to start selling them off. Yeah, So, and of course, that, I mean, there's in more recent years been issues around the materials that we used in these ex gubbies and, like and Mr. Fluffy. That's right, <laughs> which obviously has not been great for the current day owners. But tell me about the key buildings that Menzies is calling to be built and, and does get built during his time in government. Because, I mean, these are buildings that we, again, take for granted, institutions that critical to the running of this country, but they didn't come out of nothing. <laughs> the first two are quite easy. The first is the lake, mm. which means he's opened yes. and also resists any calls for the lake to be named after him. He wanted it named after Burley Griffin. The second is the National Library. And it starts in 1964, and then Menzies lays the foundation stone for that. And then, of course, he's not Prime Minister when it opens in 1968. I think it's actually opened by John Gordon, but that was one that Menzies really wanted to see, and he made a, a bit of a joke about it, and that he was being nobbled by the chief librarian, Harold White, at the library, and he said, I decided we'd have to just fund it and build this library in order to shut him up. Because <laughs> Harold White was desperate for this library to be built, is yes. that And it's, it's built beside the lake. It is right near the High Court, which yes. is obviously built in subsequent years. But the architecture of the National Library is quite striking, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's, the materials used are quite beautiful. It has a very, I would say, Roman, almost Roman appeal. I agree. Like Parthenon. Yes. Parthenon. Yeah, yeah. Which I have a vague memory. It actually is modelled on some of the actual pillars or columns are taken from the Greek style. And was that part of the design of Walter Burley Griffin or was that designed by... I don't think Burley Griffin actually had a design for the library. I could be wrong on that, but my memory is that he mentions it, but I don't think he actually designed it. That was a winning entry as a result of a competition. So the library is seen as this sort of wanting to be a grand reflection of Western civilization, of scholarship from its ancient origins in Greek and Roman times? Is that the sort of connotation of the design? Well, it had to be grand. Yes. Because the library, of course, had lived in a range of buildings over the years. They wanted something now to be grand. And again, Menzies was wanting to provide the funds to build this elaborate library, again, partly for the capital, but also to keep Harold White quiet. 
amazing the power of just one man. Mm. Uh, tell me about the Royal Australian Mint. That's great fun to visit. I've been there as a child. I must say I haven't been there in recent years, but it's a spectacular building. It is. It came later, but no, it's a, quite an impressive building. I haven't been there myself for, for quite a long time. And then in terms of the High Court, when does that move to Canberra? Oh, you've got me there. I did know, but now I'd have to look it up. But it was about 1980-something. The building was, I'm pretty sure, was approved during the Whitlam government, the High Court and the Art Gallery, and they were built one after the other. I'm just a bit hazy now on exactly when. Yes, but I mean, in subsequent years anyway, after this initial push to develop Canberra in the late 50s and 60s, you still had of course, quite a bit of catching up to do. Yes. I mean, there's an argument that Canberra didn't become a real city until the granting of an NRL franchise in the Canberra Raiders in 1982. Well, there's that. Yeah. (laughs) They also had a basketball team called the Cannons, but it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. But that sense of Canberra identity, how long do you think that takes to develop? Well, I mean, I can remember when I moved to Canberra back in 1985, again, there was that talk of Canberra as a city without a soul, but I never really found that. Once I moved there, I did take a couple of years to adjust to it and probably would have been happy to move back to Sydney. But once I settled into Canberra, I mean, it's really a great place to live. And I think with self-government too, there's much more of a sense of Canberra being the owners of their destiny and decisions that impact their lives. So that sense that it is a is a real community that has interests way outside just the business of government is certainly very strongly to this day. Actually, the majority of Canberrans didn't want self-government. They'd rather not have had it. Yes. They wanted to have a referendum. It had been one in the 70s, I think. It was defeated. They wanted another and the government wouldn't have it because the federal government, the Hawke government, was determined there was going to be self-government and the locals didn't want it, but they were going to get it. But not everybody took it seriously. So when you had your 1989 election, there were actually nominees from the sun ripened to warm tomato party. (laughs) There was the party, 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 party. And there was the having a good time party. Now, all three were the same person. It was just one person. (laughs) Quite extraordinary. (laughs) I think there are some elections in Canada at the moment. And one of the candidates is running as a dog. It's actually a person who says that if they are elected, they'll leave their decision to the dog. Okay. Right. So in actual fact, in this person's mind, the dog will be the real representative. But anyway, (laughs) not perhaps quite as funny as a summer ripened tomatoes party. I wonder, Ted, if you could reflect on Australian attitudes to Canberra. I mean, is there a sense of reverence for Canberra now in the way that there is for Washington, D.C., for example? I'd like to think so. I mean, there are many, many people who come to Canberra to visit. Basically, I mean, school children come to Canberra for you know, excursions. And there's so many things in Canberra now, things like you come to see the institutions, the War Memorial, the National Library and the others as well. So they're right up there. But also there's other things. I mean, we've got the National Folk Festival every Easter. I go to that myself. Then Floriad. Floriad. I always like Floriad. Floriad is good. That was actually a one-off in 1988. It's only going to happen once, but it's been going ever since. That's mid-September to mid-October. There's also Summer Nats, the hot rod car racing. It's got something for everyone, doesn't it, Canberra? (laughs) But that's usually in early January. Then all throughout the year, and you mentioned the Raiders, and there's also the Brumbies, the rugby team. There's, I think, a new soccer team coming into the competition, but I'm not 100% sure of that, but I vaguely think I heard that. Yeah, but outside of Canberra, how do you get the sense people, I mean, is it somewhere that Australians should be proud of? I'd like to think so, but then I'm biased. That's okay. But I I think... We welcome bias here. (laughs) Go for it. I think it should be. I mean, and also, as Canberra gets bigger, as it's been doing, it's exerting more and more influence on the surrounding areas. So a lot of people who live outside Canberra, the ACT, but work in Canberra, and they come in commute every day... Their children go to schools within Canberra. People who need medical treatment come to Canberra's hospitals because it's the largest centre in just about everywhere, southern New South Wales. And how do you think Walter Burley Griffin would reflect on the development of Canberra? I mean, this is obviously a hypothetical, but 
Is it what he had planned? Are there massive things missing that we no, never it's got? not so much missing, but things are changing. Because he designed Canberra as a bush capital, and it was designed and built as a bush capital and with lots of spaces, which are gradually being filled up. Mm. And I'm not sure he'd be happy. He might be turning in his grave if he saw what they're actually doing over the last few years. So, But Canberra, again, is spreading out. And it's getting very close to the borders with New South Wales because remembering Canberra is an island in the middle of New South Wales and it is spreading and getting ever closer. So you've got that as well. But also there's this infill so that the bush capital isn't quite as strong as it was. And why was it important to have that sense of a bush capital? Is that because it was part of the Australian identity back then in the so. I think, I early think 20th was, century? Yeah. 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 Because it's one of those myths of Australia, I think. And when you go overseas, people think it's a country full of kangaroos where we all ride a kangaroo to work and, you know, <laughs> have a sort of pat a koala on the head as we walk to school when the reality is we're an incredibly urban population. Yeah. Almost all live in cities, all on the coast. So Canberra is actually an anomaly as an idea and this sort of idea that we live in rural communities is, I mean, only true for a teeny tiny percentage of us. Yeah, I think so. So what Walter Burley Griffin was creating was an image of Australia that suited a point in time, but perhaps the Canberra of today actually is closer to what the experience of most Australians is, which is living in urban populations, having a few trees, but not many trees. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There are changes, obviously. Yeah, well, Ted, thank you so much for joining me today on Afternoon Light to talk about the development of Canberra. It's an important piece of our history, an important piece of Menzies' history, and fantastic to have someone with your knowledge and, of course, experience living in Canberra for, well, nigh on 40 years. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I like the way you've used Afternoon Light as well. Oh, thank you. I can't take credit for that, but (laughs) yes, it's a good title. Now, Ted, is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like added? The anecdotes that Menzies features in. There are a couple of others he did when he basically was talking about, he was opening the first of the Russell Defence Buildings in 1959, and he talks about John Overall, who was head of the National Capital Development Commission, and he says something, this man Overall frightens me, that the earliest indication of funding that might be available for a particular project He has the bulldozers waiting outside the next day. He's a man that wanted to get things done. That's pretty good. He did. (laughs) Actually, Ted, I was interested in the naming of the suburbs of Canberra. They're named largely after prime ministers of Australia or founding fathers of the constitution. I know there's a suburb Downer. Mm -hmm. It's named after my great-grandfather, Sir John Downer. Who decided them and and how were they decided? Well, if you want ask him why is there one not named up to Menzies, and there is a suburb for every Prime Minister starting with Deacon right through to Harold Holt, but not Menzies. Menzies was adamant he did not want a suburb named after him. And was it the National Development Commission that decided the no, names? Th- there's a place names advisory committee. Oh, right. Cho- or re- I was about to say chooses, but recommends. It's a collection of Prime Ministers, obviously, but now though historical figures or key figures who've had something to do with Canberra's growth and development. And so Woden Western Creek, which was one of the first towns of the ACT to be created once Canberra got going, how did they choose those names? Well, there's a bit of a myth. I'm not sure if this is 100% true, but Woden is named after the Norse god. And so there's other answers, but that's the one I've heard the most often that's named after the North God. Western Creek was named after an early pastoral area. And the Norse God was the Norse God of what in particular? Oh, I honestly don't know. Hopefully something good. Uh, yes, I hope so. <laughs> to make the people of Woden proud. Then you had Bell Cotton, well that was named after a form of a pastoral property. I see. And Tugranong and Gungalan were... Gungalan is Gungaleen. Yes. Which again pastoral property, and time for is also similar. Right, right. Well, names are always important and why they're chosen even more important and, of course, have some controversy. You see, they're not, they're not always Prime Ministers. Arthur Corbell, leader of the opposition, he has a suburb named after him. So there's a few others like that. Yes. Oh, well, thank you, Ted. <laughs>
That's a good addition. You're welcome. That's great. Lovely. Well, I've taken heaps of your time, so I better let you oh, get on the way to Port Arlington. Oh, thank you. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 